So thank you for tuning in to another episode of Living the Sky Life. I have the privilege today of talking to Shelby Jones. I met Shelby when I was speaking at the um, autism conference in um, the Lexington, Kentucky area um, when Temple Grandin was in town and Shelby was there promoting her children's book, which we'll get into. And um, I thought she would be a great guest to be on the podcast. So I invited her to come on and and chat with me. So thank you for um, accepting my invitation and for being a guest today, Shelby. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be able to talk about my book and uh, for everybody to get to know me a little bit. So this is my first podcast. So I'm excited (laughs) to see what it's all about too. (laughs) Well, I'll go easy on you, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) Um, well, so, you know, one of the things that intrigued me so much, um, and just in talking to you and then reading the intro to your book, um, is that you yourself are on the spectrum as well. You've accomplished a million wonderful things in your life. And, um, so I was curious though, if you were diagnosed later in life or if you were diagnosed as a child and have always known you were on the spectrum, it's, it varies for many adults that I meet. So how did that all become uh, uncovered for you? Right. Um, so for me, I was actually late diagnosed. Um, I'm 31 now, and I was actually just diagnosed the beginning of this year. Okay. So pretty much right after I turned 31. Um, but I would say, in a way, I've kind of always known something. I may not have known, hey, I think I'm on the spectrum. It wasn't like the, I guess, most well known as it is now, or um uh, one of the hot topics, I mm-hmm. guess, but I've always known that I've just been a lot different than all the other kids. So like just me being a lot quieter, mm-hmm. not just being shy, but I noticed I just didn't know how to really communicate and talk with people and make friends, even all the way starting in preschool. I already knew something was something was up Mm -hmm. (laughs) even when I was like three and four years old um the other kids wanted to play and share toys and you know do the play kitchen and all that stuff and I could have cared less I didn't really want to play with anybody I just did my own thing and I really didn't speak either that young same thing in kindergarten uh some teachers had a lot of concerns because I wasn't interacting uh, I did like to nap, though. That was my favorite <laughs> thing to do. But, you know, that doesn't involve talking. Um, but, yeah, all throughout elementary and middle school, mm-hmm. I really struggled uh, saying what was on my mind, knowing how people just connect with others. It just doesn't – it makes more sense to me now, but at the time, it didn't. Mm-hmm. Like, how are they doing this? How are they hanging out, joking with each other? And – just that so social my whole, conversation, just that social back and forth stuff was kind of awkward to you or just you didn't feel like you could chime in to those conversations. It just didn't make sense. Is pretty that what much, you're yeah, pretty much. Um, it's like I had things to say and it's in my head, but I wasn't able to get them out. Mm-hmm. Pretty much how I'm doing right now. Like <laughs> being able to, <laughs> yeah. To look at you. Yeah. Um, and just tell you more like I couldn't have done this even no 10 to 15 years ago yeah um, it's just taken a lot of practice um and it's uncomfortable for a lot of people it, I think I mean you know and just in general and especially kids nowadays too it's like it's hard to you know have conversations with kids even for me sometimes because just, their lingo is I don't even understand what they're talking about and <laughs> it's just right. it's challenging but as a kid yeah I'm sure as, as you age too, and if it's already something that's starting when you're kindergarten level and it just, it probably yeah. progressively got harder and harder as people grew up and kind of established their little friend groups. And if you weren't kind of engrossed in that conversation and in that setting, it's probably hard to break in, I would imagine. Right. You, cause yeah, like you said, the older you get, you start to notice more of those gaps mm-hmm. because there's more of that social hierarchy and things get a little bit more, you know, more peer pressure. There's, it's more complex Mm -hmm. than, you know, sharing a toy in preschool. And I mean, yeah, your people have their cliques, your friend groups, then no dating comes in and it just kind of blows up from there. 
Yeah. But I've always known. So um, the last couple of years is getting into teaching uh, disabilities. I just noticed a little more, even with me trying to teach and being a therapist. And that's a lot of communication. <laughs> <laughs> and so again, that back and forth, which is a bit of a, too much of a struggle, but yeah, I just decided I'm going to go for it. The only thing that can really happen is to say, no, you know, you're not on the spectrum and just kind of go from there. But I just went with my gut mm -hmm. and found a place I did uh, adult assessments and yeah, I came out with it and it was like a huge weight being lifted off my shoulders. Yeah, I can imagine it would be to just kind of know, I guess it probably didn't change a whole lot about the way that you live your life. And I mean, you have a really great career and, um, but maybe just knowing that it wasn't just you, that it was, there was, there was like a, a legitimate like <laughs> yeah. diagnosis or something. I'm, I'm just curious because my only experience and a lot of the people I talk to have children diagnosed that are younger. What is the um, assessment process for an adult to get a, a diagnosis of autism? Did you have to fill out questionnaires and things or how did that yeah. work? Um, so I wasn't even f most familiar with the adult assessment either because it's the main focus is on kids, mm -hmm. you know, and really there needs to be more like availability for adults, but I can see that a growing thing in the future, but uh, from what I know, I can tell you all because there is some confidential type yeah. stuff in there mm -hmm. and legal reasons. But what I can say is there are, you know, um, those little surveys, self-reports, um, maybe two of them I think I filled out. Okay. One related directly to, I forgot the name of it already. Um, but looking at autism traits and characteristics as well as well as like things in childhood what you might experience now I gotcha um but there wasn't as much on childhood and I was a little surprised because that's kind of usually where it starts mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um but I made my comments on there on what was the most prevalent prevalent thing for me as a kid and if it's something I still experience now or not um but yeah there was I did some intelligence testing, which I'm familiar with the intelligence testing as a therapist. I used to give those, but it wasn't just, you know, an IQ score. That's not going to tell you, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's not a blood test to decide either. Right. So it's one of those where the testing looked at the activities and the tasks that I had to complete, looked at certain uh, characteristics of autism that could show through what you're doing gotcha. through your responses so things that look at your spatial reasoning your um gosh, what's the word for it I'll think of it in a second but a lot of the activities it's like copying patterns mm -hmm. or going back and forth between two lists of things that are complete opposites and you got to go back and forth just naming things off the top of your head so it they just look at cognitive flexibility which I, that was a piece of it um and just your overall intellectual skills mm -hmm. of course they have to roll out other things as well so it was about a three-hour test to cover all the bases <laughs> and then towards the end was more of the testing I wasn't familiar with that looked at those type of skills. Um, so like the, I call it psychomotor speed and I call it like brain to body. Mm -hmm. So activities where you might be able to mentally do something in your head, but then you're also doing it physically. Right. The so, motor planning piece of connecting. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's a lot <clears throat> into it, but it's cool stuff. I'm kind of nerdy like that. So I like doing all those activities actually <laughs> um did you, you ever ahead. sit down with um like a neurologist or, or psychiatrist or whoever or psychologist whoever it was that was um giving that usually gives the the testing I just find it a little bit fascinating that um adults would essentially kind of go through the same testing that kids are going through but when kids like my son Skylar when he was three and I'm filling out all these forms, I'm doing it all on his behalf. 
one, because he was three and he didn't really have, he wouldn't have had much yeah. language at the time anyway, but he didn't have any, and he still doesn't have any. Um, so I'm just assuming things. And there wasn't a lot of, aside from like hand motor or hand eye coordination and motor planning and things that they could have him stack blocks or things and have him do. But the majority of the stuff was me doing and saying, well, I don't think he can do this yet or whatever. And so I would have thought that the adult testing would have evolved quite a bit more like to have a conversation (laughs) with you. Like if someone is in this situation, tell me how you would react or tell me, you know, more personal than filling out a bunch of forms. I don't know. Maybe that's just yeah. I did. crazy. I know I had the same or a similar reaction to that. That's why I put in literally, it wasn't just me filling out a survey. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, I know I did not just leave it like that because I knew it wasn't going to truly cover right things I did experience in childhood. And I tried to elaborate more. I don't know if I was just being an overthinker or if it really, if the type of questionnaires they give, even for adults, you know, can be a little bit questionable to where like, well, it can vary in different situations. It can, mm-hmm. I don't know. I could just be overthinking that, but I made sure I wrote in my comments. Um, anything I, I know I wanted to explain further so they understand and it's not just a yes or a no. Right. Or putting a number on something. I mean, I'm not always good at that. So I just wrote it down. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm like, well, if I can't, if I'm not able to actually tell them, then let me at least write it down. Mm-hmm. I also had um, some friends write a little letter of their perception of me and just their opinions. I had that sent in. I sent in a picture I was of me when I was like three. Uh, I was actually sitting there. There was some sort of music playing, a band, and I was sitting there and had. Oh, your hands you know, covering your ears. <laughs> yeah, and I just sat there. Oh, um, so I sent that in. So I added in my own stuff because I wanted it to be as thorough, like they were getting all the information. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I do wonder, like, as we learn more about adults on the spectrum, mm-hmm. especially females, what else can uh, happen within that testing? Like, how else we can really, I mean, that's like depending on how old you are 20, 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. of stuff you got to sort through yeah um well you're being very obviously candid and open to me and also in your book you know just mentioning being on the spectrum as a female is the diagnosis something that you wanted to share with people that know you very well like family and really close friends um or is it something that you just needed for you to just almost validate your feelings and your thoughts about kind of the why what the why behind a lot of the things that you did or yeah, yeah. Um, experienced did you share that with a lot of people almost like a aha moment or no it well wasn't something... well I wanted to I've always had like an interest in writing books mm-hmm. whether or not I thought I'd be able to publish one I really never thought I would uh, I just didn't know anything about the process but like I am finishing up my autobiography now I'm pretty close to having it uploaded the formatting piece you know make sure it all looks okay but I did have to think about that like do I just want it for me make my own book like basically a diary do I want that to go public what should be included what shouldn't Mm -hmm. you know what would my family read it how would they take it and so yeah all those questions kind of popped up of how I wanted to share if I wanted to but overall I decided As I started to write, it became more like a healing process. Mm -hmm. Now that I understand, you know, that aha moment, I'm like, oh gosh, it all makes sense now. As I'm going back one chapter, one event after the other, I'm like, well, I kind of do want people to know about this, including my parents, because they didn't quite understand. They tried, but, you know, somebody who really couldn't communicate what was going on, how are they supposed to be able to... Mm -hmm. How is anybody else able to help you if you can't even tell them? Um, so that's why I also like working with what I do now. Most of my kiddos, if not all, are, are totally nonverbal. Mm-hmm. And so just working through that as well. But I decided just to help me heal a little bit, get get something like that out in the market, 
uh, not just like research books like we see with just autism and disabilities, but personal experiences. Other people can read it, whether they have autism or not. They know somebody who is, or they have a friend mm-hmm. or coworker, things like that. Um, so on top of writing the children's book, I decided, well, I'm going to really write one about me and also turn it into something for kids yeah. as well. So I get both adults and children. Yeah. Well, it's helpful for parents like me because I'm, again, just guessing all the time about Skylar and what he's thinking and what he's feeling and what he's going through. I'm not on the spectrum. And so I, I just, I don't pretend to know everything, but whenever I can learn from adults who are verbal and who are on the spectrum and they can share with me, you know, this might be something he's experiencing. You might want to consider this or something, you know, it just, it's helpful to me. I, I try to take everything I can, um, from the people that live it every day. And, um, so it's helpful to me. You, you mentioned, um, a minute ago that you, um, with what you do for a living, and I know you're a special education teacher for those with moderate to severe disabilities. Is that something you always wanted to do? Or do you think that, um, kind of subconsciously your, just your experiences as a child and growing up in the school system and, you know, all the things that you went through and you, kind of related about in your, in your book, um, did that kind of drive you to this career to help kids on the spectrum or with other disabilities? Well, at least through elementary and middle school, I really didn't know. I was still trying to figure out me, Mm -hmm. like why I didn't quite fit in and all that fun stuff. Um, but in high school, I think it was, I had some type of interest we had, you know, another special education classroom within the high school, and I wasn't able to work in that classroom or volunteer or anything, but just being able to see those students, I was always just interested. Hey, what are they doing? Mm-hmm. How are they able to help them? Um, because they wanted to learn just like everybody else. Right. There's just a different way to go about it sometimes. But it wasn't until I was in college and I actually got my first assistant job in a preschool. I still call it FMD, but it's still a moderate to severe disabilities early childhood classroom. And it was something my grandma actually told me about because she knows I like to work with kids, you know, babysitting and things like that. So I thought I'd give it a shot. And even from like day one, I was amazed by it, what I was watching, all the therapists that had come in, watching them feed like G-tubes and watching for seizures, you know, just watching speech and occupational therapy and physical therapy and just seeing how they are working with these kids and what their goals are mm-hmm. that are obviously going to be a bit different than in a typical classroom where you might be doing more math, more more science and social studies. And these kiddos were really working on the independence. And so it was just really neat to see. And I had that job about four years, which was the longest job I had. (laughs) And it didn't really feel like you were going to work, if that makes sense. That's nice. Yeah, that's a nice feeling. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was deciding as I was getting my college degree, I'm like, okay, I love psychology. I really like special education. Which one should I go for? Um, They both, to me, kind of mix with each other. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I don't know which way to go. And, you know, I'm 22, 23 years old at that time. And, I mean, you just don't know sometimes. And I just went on the mental health side because I love that, too helping people with anxiety and depression because I experienced a lot of anxiety and a lot of that did stem from being on the spectrum, being overstimulated, too much going on in a classroom. And so I decided when I became a therapist, I really missed what I was doing on my other job and I had to decide through COVID, long story short, we all know about the COVID <laughs> lockdown and all that. Yeah. So I won't get in all that, but I had some time to think and I had to tell myself, Hey, do I want to continue being a therapist 
working with kids, mainly with like ADHD and more trauma related issues? Or would I rather go back to my other workplace and say, I'm going back with my kiddos with disabilities. And to me, it was just no question. And a part of that was also during the lockdown, I won't say what job it was, but I was put into a job I absolutely hated. <laughs> and I, it was not my choice, but I had to pay the rent because you couldn't get a job anywhere else. Right. Um, so I almost had to, I want to say go to hell and back, but go in positions I really, that were not for me. I just hated it. And then it just put everything into perspective on what I really wanted to be doing. And so I went through the process. I, I research a lot. So I had to research teaching programs, how you apply, how can I get this preschool FMG job, FMD job uh, specifically. Mm-hmm. So that took, you know, months of planning, applying for the program, how to take the praxis. They had to have test scores. <laughs> um yeah, I was able to get into Hardin County Schools uh, two years ago. So I was there for two years in low incidence. And I had one workplace I really wanted to get back into, which is the same place I was the assistant. And that was like my goal, my dream job. And I was able to land it the beginning of this school year. So I was able to start in a month ago, beginning of September. So yeah, I love it. I still don't feel like I go to work every day. It's, it's, it's it's nice. And it's also wild to me to hear someone say that moderate to severe disabilities is just like, you know, not even like going to work (laughs) and just, you love it. I'm like, Oh my gosh, we need to like clone you many times over because that, that is the biggest complaint that I have. And that, um, you know, most parents that I talk to have is we can't find respite. We can't find anyone with a child with you know, moderate to severe needs and profound needs, including incontinence and, you know, all the things that go along with needing to help their every single need every single day. People are not interested. They want more of the cute little kids who just need a little bit of speech therapy each week and, you know, extra help with OT and PT. But aside from that, they're not, you know, they don't require that much hands-on. And, especially as our kids get older, the older and older they are, the less people are interested in interacting with them. So um, I appreciate so much your perspective and your attitude about helping little kids. And I'm sure you would be the same way with it (laughs) if it was high school kids too, high school age with severe challenges. Yeah. It's like, I mean, yeah, because I've never had a job to where, you know, Monday's coming up. Oh, tomorrow's Monday. I mean, I you know, you go just, to work. <laughs> I mean, everybody, no matter what job you have, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's Monday, you know, mm-hmm. but going in there, I don't have like not sense of dread of, Oh, I got to go in today mm-hmm. or when's lunch, you know, <laughs> uh, when do I get to leave? And no, of course that doesn't mean there's not more challenging days Sure. or the same typical behaviors, you know, I help work with consistently. 24 seven every day that I'm there. Mm-hmm. But to me, it's, I don't know, I'm usually a very intuitive person on top of that. And I can sometimes just read what they might really want or need. Mm-hmm. Or like my room, I don't like a whole lot of light. Uh, I mean, I'll do natural light. That's my favorite type of light, but very bright classrooms stuff like clutter um everybody talking consistently I mean classrooms are like that but not just with me but uh, my kiddos that's just way too much Mm -hmm. and so what I do in my room and even all the staff have commented like they want to stay in my room when they come (laughs) in there like oh this is look at this room it's so cool I'm like well that was my goal maybe you're teaching them too I mean to be more accommodating (laughs) to kids it just, I like to use the environment, mm-hmm. like the environmental psychology um, and for behavioral modification as well. I use that to my advantage, but I pull up the blinds. There's a lot of natural light coming in. I've got, I call it my fish tube and it's like a bubble tube. And so I turn my lights off and you see the bubbles and it lights up. 
I've got light boards on the floor and I've got, I call it a star light. It's something that projects onto the wall mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's got stars. And so everything we do, we're not in total darkness or anything, but it really brings the mood down and the kids enjoy it. It's calming. Mm-hmm. People peek in there and they're like, <laughs> they, wow, are they napping really, all day? <laughs> it's, uh, they probably, I assume people would assume that like the light's always off. Like, are you guys ever in your classroom? <laughs> and they peek in there and some of the therapists would be like, oh, well, I didn't want to even knock on the door. It looks so quiet. And I said, it's, I try to keep it to where it's calming for them during breaks, whenever we work. And yeah. I like it myself. It As soon as those lights come back on, it's like, okay, now I know why I keep them off. <laughs> I just don't think people realize that they, even your attitude, like coming in and enjoying being there, our kids sense that anybody can. Like if you're just yes. kind of grumpy in a, on a Monday or if they can just feel that you don't want to be there, that's going to trigger them too. It, it's same as all these other exterior things like lighting and sound and all of that stuff that's triggering, but they're very intuitive individuals. I feel like I know Skylar oh, yeah. is. Oh yeah. If I cannot regulate my body and my tone with him on days that I'm stressed out about something that has nothing to do with him and I'm trying to spell with him or I'm trying to do something, he's just not into it. He, you know, maybe hits me more. He just is not vibing with me. And it's because of me. I just need to calm down and just put myself in his, you know, whatever mood he's in. And just kind of, you know, focus on regulating my own attitude and behavior if I want to. Yeah, I tell people, I try to tell people all the time, I said, and it's with any kid, whether they have some special need or they don't, I said, kids are very sensitive. They know if something's not right. They know if somebody's mad, even whether they're nonverbal or they're even looking at you. They, they can tell like their attitude can change their body language. Mm-hmm. And so like trying to, like most people, you try and create that balance between work life, you know, your home life, mm-hmm. leave things at home that need to stay at home. Uh, you go into work, it's, you got to focus on those kids. Don't let, and it's, it's hard to do sometimes, you know, you have your bad days. You have a kiddo that for some reason, you just don't have the same amount of patience that day you gotta mm-hmm. you know be a tag team be like you know what tag you're it you know take a moment and then go right back to it and so I tell them all the time like hey we come in I call them people like um who are always just negative like negative Nancy's yes and I said I do not allow negative Nancy's in my room I said there's no room for that the kids feel that we feel that it's not enjoyable you know just come in Every day's a new day. Just make it the best that you can. Mm -hmm. How do you provide feedback to the parents on the day? Do you send a daily note home? Do you have like a, like a journal or something that goes back and forth or how, how do you prefer um, to do that? Because I think that's, that's something that I addressed when I was doing my, my uh, keynote at the, at the conference is just, um, I don't allow negativity um, when Skylar is brought to my car at the end of every day, because I mean, I immediately noticed, I don't like it anyways, but some days I, I kind of just forgot that they were talking negative And I immediately noticed Skylar's body language shift because they were saying like, we had a really tough day today. Uh, there was a lot of PA, PD and SIB and, you know, a lot of aggression and, you know, he just really didn't want to sit down and work. And I'm, I'm just looking at him while they're talking and I'm like, no more of this. So I can read it on the note that you send me every day. I want you to, if you're going to say anything at all, say we had really fun time with music. Like he loved music today because when they do that, he starts laughing and he's smiling and clapping in the car. And that's how I want to drive home with him is like, buddy, that's so awesome that you, you know, love the music that they played for you today or whatever. And then I read the other stuff. And if I need to say something back to them, I'll email them and say, I understand about today's aggression or whatever. And we changed a medicine and this might be why, whatever. He doesn't need to be part of any of that conversation. So sorry to my question. (laughs) So how do you, (laughs) how do you go back and forth with parents? 
Yes. Um, to start, I do agree with being careful, talking again with any kiddos, but especially with ours. Some people just assume that they just don't know what's going on, mm-hmm. don't comprehend mm-hmm. what's being said. Yes. And sometimes if you're around them all the time, you know if they know. And sometimes we might never know what they are really understanding, mm-hmm. but still it's out of respect for anybody else. You wouldn't want to go up when somebody's standing there and be like, did you see what this person did today? And they're standing right there. I know. That's exactly. And yeah. I'm like, so don't do it to the kids either. But for communication wise, I try and ask the parents, you know, how they like to be communicated with some uh, I don't usually text. I try and stay away. Yeah. Like, I don't want to give out my my cell phone number and things like that. But I like using, it's an app called uh, Class Dojo. Okay. And to me, it's like a mini Facebook for your classroom. I can make posts. Um, as long as everybody has permissions, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, I always double check that. I can post pictures. So every week I can post, you know, pictures of what, activities they've they've been doing and pictures of them smiling um having a good time so parents can see what we're doing we love that we'd love to know what they're doing yeah that's and also i love posting videos i mean i'm not a parent myself but especially if i was a parent of a child with special needs who isn't able to tell me what they did at school or what's going on seeing those pictures Mm -hmm. having the teacher post hey this week we're gonna be working on like this week we did numbers and counting. And so I'll put on there each month, hey, here's our unit. Here's three different lessons we're going to be working on. Feel free to work with this, you know, with your child at home. Just trying to make that connection. So if they're working on it at home, some families do, some don't. Mm-hmm. But I try to encourage, you know, that type of uh, participation and engagement with families. And they can also message me. So it's not my number. It's um, kind of like Facebook Messenger. Mm-hmm. And I can message each parent. They can message me for day-to-day stuff. If someone's going to be here, if they're not going to be here, if I think somebody's not feeling good, I can message them. But I also do have folders with a communication log. And every day I put what kind of mood they were in. I put, there's a log of, you know, diaper changing. If Mm -hmm. they still have diapers and pull-ups, I write down what times, you know, dry, wet, all that good stuff. That's what we always ask for. That's what our form looks like. We, we, we need to know about the BMs because of his Crohn's. Like that's a crucial information and the food. Like, did he eat and what did he eat? Did he like it? Did not? (laughs) That's terrible. Yes. That's on there. That's on there too. (laughs) Like percentage wise. If I have enough time, I'll even write down exactly what I know they ate. Um, I try to be as detailed as I can. Yeah. And at the bottom, I might write a comment, you know, had a great day. We worked on, uh, last week we did patterns. So we worked on using blocks and making patterns or we make, we did an art activity today. And, you know, I try to make positive comments in there and send those home in the folders. Parents can get it that way too. So I do both the class dojo as well as those folders. That's awesome. So there's information everywhere they can always call the school there's some way to get a hold of me yeah for me to get a hold of them so I try to make sure because the kids can't go home and say I didn't eat lunch today (laughs) or you know they refuse to eat and I had to feed them through their g-tube I'll I'll put that in the note Um, small details that people may not think yeah are the most important things to keep track of but the bathroom schedule Uh, People don't realize how important that really is for some kids, Mm -hmm. how much they ate, if they're refusing to eat. Yeah, Um, that's very, but even if, (laughs) even if they have a rough day, like I don't want to like beat around the bush or sugarcoat and just never say if they had a rough day about with something, but if something's out of the ordinary, if they're crying a lot more, um, or if there's a lot more scratching or biting or anything of that nature, I might mention it to them. Like most of my kids ride a bus home, um, but I can still message like, Hey, so-and-so 
maybe we started out having a rough morning. They didn't want to sit, stay in their seat for more than two minutes. Like they just struggled more staying in their seat, uh, wanting to throw things off the table. But usually I'll end it with, but we continue to work through that. And we were able to complete the activity. He got a break. And I just make sure there's trying to end with a positive too, because there's always a positive somewhere. Right. Yeah. And I sent, I just sent home some pictures. I printed out some of like the best pictures of the kids that I've gotten so far and just send them home in their folder. So their parents have that. Aww, so if they man. didn't see it on Dojo, they're getting it sent home. Um, You're teasing me, man. I I, I, mean, just, <laughs> I might have to offer you like triple your salary to just have you just work with Skylar only. <laughs> like, just, <laughs> I might have to have you move up here and like um, just just work with him because I mean, that sounds like a dream. So, um, well, I want to um, move into your um, your children's book that you wrote, which is called Call Me Mosley. Mosley, right? That's how I say it. Yes. Um, yeah. And it tells the story of an eight-year-old girl with autism who is starting third grade in a public school for the first time and all the ways in which she struggles to connect with other kids her age. So I guess it's probably an obvious question, but what prompted you to write this book? Well, just like with my autobiography that I'm trying to finish up here in the next month, um, I really, I noticed that when I, you know, go to Amazon or any, like Barnes and Noble, I got the idea thing. I'm sure other people have written similar things, you know, so I just kind of researched it and noticed I'm not really seeing anything, especially with actual children's books. Mm -hmm. And little girls too, um, I think you said. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if there was one related to autism, you know, like you just said, most of the main character, you know, is a boy and which is totally fine. I mean, that's, um, but what I was looking for, I'm like, well, where's all the girls? And with me just being diagnosed and everything, I was really looking for that, how I can introduce something like this and open up a new market. You know, it's not just for kids with disabilities it's for anybody mm -hmm. but I wanted you know other kids to be able to see this and read this and maybe make a connection like oh well I do that or I wear headphones or one of my friends in school you know rocks back and forth or wear, wears those headphones and just either introducing autism as something they've never heard before and mm -hmm. just bringing it up and learning about it or just recognizing certain behaviors and I guess being able to normalize some of what kids see in schools and it's you know it's not anything to be afraid of and they can still be your friends and mm -hmm. just um, people that are different than you like well you're different than them so you're both different. <laughs> right. I yeah. think all of us are different in some way. <laughs> I don't really know what normal is. I know. Um, I know. It's, it's really just nice not. to have children's books like, like yours and, you know, the others that are out there um, presented at a young age in schools. I don't know if you've done any of this yet, because I know this book just recently came out, but, um, you know, reading, having reading sessions in schools. I know they, a lot of elementary schools offer that parents or people to come in and read to them. I think the earlier you introduce books like yours to little kids, they become much nicer grown kids and more <laughs> inclusive and more understanding and more compassionate and patient and all the things with our kids who need a little extra help. I love the high schools that have programs with the upperclassmen, um, you know, being a, a buddy to someone in oh, yeah. the special yeah. education classrooms or whatever. I just think those things are, are needed and, and it eventually turns them into kind adults, you know, who are understanding and accepting and not using the R word and things like that anymore. Oh gosh, that drives me nuts. I know. I mean, that's a whole nother episode, <laughs> but I mean, so yeah. I uh, thank you for writing this book and I hope that it gets in more hands um, 
of people who are raising little kids at this point, because it's, it's a great tool to use if you aren't, if you don't have someone with autism in your family or a disability to just read to your kids at night, it's, and then have a discussion about it. I think that's helpful, right? I mean, it would help all the other yeah. students I even, in your school. Since you brought that up, because I liked how you, you said it better than me. <laughs> I, just, I can't always explain things a certain way, but I'll kind of repeat what you just said with this book, especially with it being more geared towards elementary, mm -hmm. but again, any kiddo who wants to read it. Um, it's to help create that respect mm -hmm. and empathy and understanding. I mean, that is one of my main goals with that is people are afraid of what they don't understand. Right. And I understand how some people may view it as scary because they've never seen somebody act a certain way before. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's different noises they've never heard. Maybe there is a little bit of aggression going on or a lot of aggression. And I know that scares a lot of people. Um, and so I was curious also, I had both of my nieces. Well, one of them is able to read. She's almost nine. My other niece is two, so she's not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> but but I know she likes books and cartoons. So I had asked my niece, um, and I sat down with her and I said, Hey, do you know what this is? And I held, held up the book and she's like, Yeah, that's your book with Mosley. I'm like, Yeah, it is my book. I said, You know, you've read this before, right? She's like, Yeah. I said, Well, who did you read it with? And of course, you know, with my grandma. And I'm sure her mom being my sister, you know, has read it to her and I opened it and I said, do you know what this book is about? You know, just curious mm -hmm. what an eight year old would say to this. I mean, cause the character in the story is eight years old. And I said, you know, she has her pet rat. She kind of helps her and they love the pet rat Theo. And I said, mostly. Do you know what she has? And she goes, yeah. I said, well, what, is, what does she have? And she looked at me and with all seriousness, she goes, a rat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, she does. You're right. She's got a pet rat. <laughs> and so I haven't sat down with her and like said, hey, this is what it's really like. The main goal is what it's truly about. Uh, but I know I've mentioned the word autism to her. Mm -hmm the headphones hey if you see a kid in your class or in your school that maybe does those things mm -hmm. you can you can be friends with them and just like I said slowly introducing right so people aren't scared or I think I her mean, response is the perfect one though that's that's what I would want I think is for people to kind of go yeah so like yeah I, I see yeah, not kids in my school label. all the time with headphones on I don't care. I mean, that's what we would love to get to a place where it's like, yeah, so that doesn't matter. I, there's tons yeah, of kids that wear headphones that don't like noise or whatever. And instead of, I don't know, shying away because they have the label of autism or whatever. So, well, where can people find uh, Call Me Mosley? I think you said Barn Barnes and Noble online is the, the best place or the only place right now to get it. Is that right? Yes. For right now. Okay. Um, if you were, no, it's not on the Barnes and Noble, like main websites where you right. can just scroll and see it because it was independently published. Right. So it's on the Barnes and Noble press. However, you can still go to barnesandnoble.com and just type in the title. Okay. Just type in Call Me Mosley and the product page should pop up, you know, description, um, a place where you'd be able to purchase it if you want to. And I've also got that link on my Facebook author page okay. as well. I know well we I'll link quite those up. That yet. Yeah. Yep. I will link up um the the order spot for Barnes and Noble and then I can link up your Facebook author page also so people can easily click um on it. So that's a perfect segue before we close. I want you to to also share with us about um anything else you want the listeners to know about you and maybe your author page and anything else you've got going on or you want to share about yourself with us 
oh gosh, where to start? What about me? <laughs> well, I mean, all I can really say is, you know, I feel like from childhood to now, just seeing my personal growth and progression with being, I had very little, you know, language and communication and I didn't really start. I mean, I might say your basic words like no, or apparently my favorite quote was leave me alone. <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, that comes I didn't want to do that myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so having that speech delay, communication delay, even through age of seven, I wasn't having like full conversations. I might speak in very short sentences, but people would just saw me as shy. Oh, she's so shy. And this and that when I just didn't know how to do it. And not being able to really make friends throughout most of my life. It's still kind of a struggle now, but I pushed myself to learn how to initiate, find something, just go say hi to somebody. I still have to remind myself or ask myself, have I talked to somebody today outside of my classroom? <laughs> have <laughs> I talked okay. to somebody? Otherwise, I become like a recluse, you know, unknowingly just zone out into my own world. So I do have to remind myself to communicate, but I mean, I never thought I'd be able to even express not just words verbally, but because you need that for the written expression too, but I write better than I speak sometimes. So I thought, hey, just put it all in writing. If that's, you know, my gift and so it's been a dream come true being able to be able to publish this book. And especially for kids and get my own personal book out. And I got, you know, my author page going, just trying to help promote some of that and get feedback from everybody. So I want to know their ideas of what else they would like to see in a children's book and how else I can help express some of the more unknown and common experiences, things people have to think about. Getting a haircut, a mm -hmm. birthday party. I mean, having a conversation. Yeah. So, um, maybe your I'll next like book. Continue. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> That's the thing. Oh, no, maybe your fine. next book should be Mosley goes to high school, and then like the it little is. friends <laughs> that she met, and like and how those friends help her in high school or don't. Like people that you know she has to run into at high school that are a little different that don't know her or didn't know her growing up. So maybe that could yeah. be your seg your sequel. <laughs> yeah, I thought about you know if people like this sort of thing especially if the kids like it like should I make it a little Mosley series and that's where the other feedback and ideas come from because I know I can write based off my experiences which does make it easier for me to write but I still want to know like I said open up that market what else needs to be out there or, or addressed or yeah so I even thought going to the dentist um going to Walmart which not a lot of people like going to Walmart either. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> um, so I'm like, well, we can all relate to that one. <laughs> but I'm like, what else can I write? Mostly go to the dentist. No well, sleepover. I can, when I link up your Facebook author page for all the listeners, if you guys have suggestions for what would make a really helpful children's book for you to share with your kids and the experiences that you're going through, like you're mentioning the dentist and the, all the doctors, all the, all the oh, haircuts, yeah. all the stuff that would also be really helpful, but, but yeah, they can write in and connect with you and make some suggestions. It could be a group yeah. project. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I definitely appreciate that. Um, I'm just excited to try and continue being, you know, a children's author and advocate for disabilities. And I will say with my books being like a dream come true, since you mentioned the very beginning, how we had met at the Temple Grandin conference yeah. a month or so ago. And so I've always wanted to meet her. I've seen all her YouTube videos <laughs> with her speeches, but never in person. And I couldn't believe when I had my stuff set up. And she just kind of walked in and it took me a second. I know it. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm like, am I really like, did Dr. Grandin just casually walk in here? And, I'm and like, she, yeah, did. she did. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to go say hi to her as soon as possible. It's my only chance. And so I showed her my book 
uh, call me Mosley and she actually autographed my personal copy. And so I don't know, it's been a lot to process, but in a good way. Yeah. Of me finally fulfilling what I know I need to be doing. And I don't know where I'm going to be five, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, but hopefully this is a part of it and I can have my own conference or maybe not as a public speaker. I may not be the main speaker. Let me just <laughs> throw that one out there. Dream big though. You know, it's like, it's just, I can, you never yeah. know. You never know. But yeah, I'm excited mm -hmm. for people who are interested to follow the link, see my page. Yeah. You know, check out the book, share it. If you're not interested, you know, maybe somebody, you know, would be and just getting the word out is really yeah. all I can ask. That's wonderful. It's all about supporting each other and um, making this village of autism, individual autistic individuals and families and caregivers and all the things uh, much, much larger. That's why I do what I do with this podcast. And I'm just trying to introduce people to each other that can benefit from one way or another and learning from each other. So um, I, like I said, I will link up all of the ways in which you guys, the listeners can communicate with Shelby and get a copy of her book. And I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's not the most comfortable thing to do <laughs> to be on your first <laughs> podcast, but hopefully you had a good experience. <laughs> it wasn't yes, traumatic for you. <laughs> good. Well, yeah, thanks I so much for your time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We'll have a good rest of your evening. All right. You too.